Welcome to The Roofer Show with your host, Dave Sullivan. You found the podcast that helps roofing contractors grow their businesses, make more money, and have more free time. Each week, Dave interviews the industry's top experts who will give you actionable tips and strategies for the real world of construction to help you take your roofing business to the next level. So let's get down to business. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Roofer Show, the place to be if you want to grow a more profitable roofing business. I'm your host, Dave Sullivan, and I've been a successful roofing contractor for over 30 years, and I'm here to share with you what I've learned. You can get more tips, strategies, and downloads by going to my website at theroofershow.com. If you listen to the intro, this show is all about helping you grow your business, making more money, and having more free time. And today, we're going to talk about making more money. Not only making more money, but keeping more money. And to help us do that is our guest today, Craig Cody of Craig Cody & Company. Craig used to be a New York cop for 17 years before he retired. Then he went into accounting and became a CPA. There's got to be a story there. Not only is Craig a CPA, but he's also a certified tax coach. And that requires a continued education on various tax planning techniques and strategies in order to become certified. And it's with this organization that he co-authored a book. It's an Amazon bestseller called The Secrets of a Tax-Free Life. As the title of the show suggests, it's not how much money you make, but it's how much money you keep. And that's what we're going to talk to Craig about today. So let's get into the interview with Craig Cody. Craig, thanks for coming on to the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Now, I, I went through your book, The Secrets of a Tax-Free Life, and you've got some great stuff in there. But I especially like this one chapter, The Top 10 Most Expensive Tax Mistakes That Business Owners Make. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today, because I know I've made a lot of them. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little about your background. I know you're a CPA, but you're also a certified tax coach. Can you tell us a little about what that is? Sure. Um, I'm a CPA and a certified tax coach. And what a certified tax coach is, is I belong to a select group. There's about, you know, maybe a hundred of us throughout the country. And we focus on tax planning and we do about 10 days a year in um, continuing education that deals with tax planning. So we're really focused on trying to, you know, help our clients keep more of what they make. I like that. The tax codes are always changing. They're always coming up with new ways to screw us over. And you got Trump in there. See what happens. Um, stock market seems to think he's going to make some changes, but we'll wait and see. But I like paying taxes. It means I'm making money, and it uh, beats the alternative. But I just don't want to pay more than I have to. And that's what being proactive and getting your tax planning down is so important. Now, I generally see two types of contractors. First are the hustlers always looking to work for cash. And they'll give a discount, you know, if you pay, pay cash, not a check. That's short-term thinking. And the second are the ones always looking in the rearview mirror. You know, they bust their ass and get to the end of the year and pay more than they should. They're always reactive, didn't have a plan. They have nothing left over. Neither one of these guys are going to be around very long. And uh, one of them is probably going to be breaking rocks. And there's a difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. That's the one you go to jail for. Wouldn't you agree, Craig? Yes, I would. I, I, th I think you need to plan. It's probably the biggest mistake people make out there. You know, somebody used to uh, say to me, uh, you know, when I started out, I was, and, and don't take offense to this, you know, I was just a schmuck with a truck. He says, but now I have a business and I have things I have to protect. So I need to plan. One of the things that's so great about owning a business, which is besides the long hours and sleepless nights, but are the tax advantages <laughs> that we have over simply by being an employee. In your book, you talk about the top 10 mistakes that contractors make you know, when it comes to taxes. So I want to jump into these, but I'm not sure if we have enough time to get through all 10, so let's be sure we hit the big ones. Sure. And first off, this is where I make my disclaimer that I'm not a CPA. So don't listen to any of my advice, but talk to Craig. So <laughs> if that's okay, 
Let's get into this. So let's talk about, let's start getting into those top 10 items, Craig. The first one in your book is failing to plan. Let's go through these. Yeah. So, so most people, you know, when they go to buy a car or a truck or a piece of equipment, they do some research, right? What kind of research did people do when they started their business? They probably did none. They spoke with their attorney, maybe, and he said, form an LLC or form an S corporation, and they formed the entity, and they moved on their merry way. Where if they did some planning, maybe they brought their attorney and their CPA in the same room or maybe on the same phone call, and they figured out, you know, what's the best way to protect you on the legal side and what's the best way to protect you on the tax side. They put their heads together and they come up with, you know, a solution that might save you some money. So we see that as, you know, the biggest issue, failing to plan. You know, they're not communicating with their CPA. Most accountants do a very good job. They put the right numbers in the right boxes, but there's no planning. Everybody's looking in the rearview mirror. No one's looking forward. And we tell people, you need to look forward. You need to communicate with us or your CPA so you can see how you can take advantage of the tax code, the same way Warren Buffett does it, the same way Donald Trump does it. Why can't you do it? I agree. And it's so many times the contractor is generally uh, reactive and not proactive. It's, it's like when it comes to job costing. We wait until the job's done before we find out what's going on. And that's what happens so often with taxes. Uh, you get to the end of the year, and boom, there's not much you can do about it because you didn't plan. Exactly, exactly. Where if you just took some time during the year and you did some planning and you communicated, you'd probably save yourself some money. Because you know what? There's nothing here that's rocket science. That's the wonderful thing about it. These guys will take uh, three or four hours to go through and try to find a better, uh, better airline flight, try to get a better deal on their car. But when it comes to the big money, which is saving on your taxes, they just don't, just don't think about it. Right. And, and, you know, most people look at it as an expense item, you know, consulting with your CPA. And I always tell, tell people it's an income item. The more time you spend with me, the more money I can save you. And let's talk about the wrong entity, because that's something when, they, when these guys get started, start up a new business, so often they're either a sole proprietorship or they're setting up the wrong structure. What do you see in your practice? Uh, we see the same thing. We see people come to us, they're sole proprietors, and they have no liability protection at all. Or we see them set up as an LLC, and they're making you know a, a lot of money and maybe paying over, overpaying in taxes. Um, we see S corporations sometimes when maybe they shouldn't be set up as an S corporation. It might be a better, maybe in their case, an LLC is better for them. Or we'll see a C corporation, you know, which pays tax at its own level, and and. Always, it's there was no planning done as far as why they chose that entity. It's just they spoke with the attorney. He said, do this. You know, he was looking purely from uh, a liability per, you know, perspective versus having any insight on the tax side. So, you know, for me, an LLC may make sense, but it may, and we may be in the same business, but for you, an S corporation may make sense. And, and typically, you know, a sole proprietorship is never really going to make sense because you have so much liability there. Yeah, in the roofing business, we don't want, we've got to have uh, a corporate right. structure and have some protection. Otherwise, we could lose everything. So when I'm playing a CPA, I suggest to the contractors that I'm working with that, as we said, never ever set up as a sole proprietor. One, you have no protections from lawsuits. And if you're in the roofing business, you're going to get sued. Second, Sole proprietors have, from what I hear, four times more likely to get audited because of all the sham hobby businesses that are set up that way. And audits, they're no fun. I've gone through two of them. The first one, there was no change because I had great documentation. And I've always been pretty aggressive when it comes to my tax planning. And then the second time, the auditor was leaving his job and his boss told him to clear his files. That was, um, that was a good one to be lucky with. Now we've got the two flow-through entities, the Subchapter S and the LLC. I'm not a CPA and I'm not giving advice, but the operating company of your business should not be set up as an LLC. That should be a Subchapter S as you're starting off, and it generally takes a few years before you're making money. You're pulling out most everything for your living expenses. Now, as time goes on, you become more successful, and now you're reinvesting 
profits into the company to grow your business, that may be the time to switch over to a C-Corp. <laughs> Let's get it from the expert. And Craig, can you uh, tell us about the different types of entities, if you could? Let's get into each one of those. Yeah, sure. So w- when you're an LLC, a single member LLC, or maybe there's two of you, so you're taxed as a partnership instead of a single member LLC, um, at the end of the year, you take the profit of the company and based on your percentage, okay, or well, the agreement, you pick up your percentage of income. And it's all subject to self-employment tax. Whereas when you're an S corporation, you still split it based on your ownership percentages, but it's not all subject to self-employment tax. Just your salary, which has to be reasonable, is subject to self-employment tax. That being said, it doesn't always make sense to be a corporation versus an LLC, depending on what's going on, how much money you're making. You know, maybe maybe starting out, you're not expecting, it's a side hustle maybe when you first start out, you're not expecting to make that much money. Um, you might start out with an LLC, but you need to know and your advisor needs to know that, you know what, I can make a late election and I could choose to have my LLC taxed as a corporation or an S corporation, thus saving me money going forward. So I have the legal liability protection of an LLC, but I'm being taxed like an S corporation. So it sounds like there's a little more involved than just going to legal zoom and <laughs> setting up a corporation of yes and 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 I always tell people when you're in a type of business where you might be sued, you know you should be dealing directly with an attorney because you know what if they screw up, you could sue them. if you go to legal zoom and you do it yourself and you screw up, who are you going to sue? yeah <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty big deal when you're setting up a company, and you really got to have some professional help doing it. Yes, we, you know, sometimes people trip over dollars to save pennies. Is that the saying? Yeah, exactly. Well, what about the wrong retirement plan? Let's talk about that because owning a small business, this is one of the big benefits that you can have is your retirement plan. Let's talk a little about that. Right. So depending on how old you are, um, how many people you have as employees, um, the the typical standard retirement plan out there is going to be a 401k. Um, And there's testing that has to be done because the government says we don't want to make sure that the owner is not getting all the benefit and none of his employees are putting money into it. So depending on the size of your company, uh, a 401k can be a home run, especially if you're employing your wife, if she's working in the business, um, each of you could put between 18 and $24,000 away. And then you do have to match uh, a percentage of, of what your employees are putting in. So there's some expense there. But, you know, when it's a smaller company, the expense usually is overridden by the benefit that you're going to get. But as your company grows and you have more and more employees, you may need to look at other structures as a way to save for retirement. Now, you mentioned the wives. In your book, you talk about family employment. What's the deal about that? So um, usually when we talk about family employment, we're talking about, you know, the wife or we're talking about the kids. Maybe your kids are doing work for you. And where the real benefit is, is it allows you sometimes to take a non-deductible expense and make it a deductible expense. And I'll explain it like this. Uh, say little Johnny's going to hockey camp, all right? And I'm just, and it's a really expensive one. It's costing you $5,000 a year. That might cost you $7,500 in gross to net $5,000. But instead of doing that, what if little Johnny worked for you and he came in you know, once or twice a week and he did something and you documented what he was doing and he got paid and that money was direct deposited into his bank account. And then when hockey camp came around, they just debited his account for the tuition. So what you've done is you've made a non-deductible expense deductible. Um, The same thing with your wife. If you have a 401k plan and you want her to be, you know, eligible and she's doing stuff in your business, maybe she's, you know, answering phones, maybe she's drawing up contracts, she could be doing anything. Um, If if she's on the payroll, she's allowed to contribute to a 401k, and that could be another $18,000 to $24,000 you're safe. So when my kids were younger, uh, they went to private high school, Um, they all worked for me, the money got direct deposited into their bank account, and the school was on a monthly payment plan, and they drafted their account every month. So I turned it into a a deductible uh, expense when in reality it really wasn't, but just the way it was structured. I had the same thing set up with my kids, and my wife and kids all worked in the company, and when they were young, they were sweeping up the floor. 
it's a great way to save on taxes. Right. And the important thing is that you document what they're doing. They right. sign in, they sign out. So you need all the documentation because you don't want the IRS to come knocking on your door and then you have to scramble. You know, these are legitimate deductions if done, if done legitimately. Yeah. And I think that's the big point is that you've got to document all of this that we're talking about here. Yes. Now, the home office, a lot of people are always afraid to deduct that because – uh, so many of us have heard that that's going to be an automatic audit. But in your book, you like the home office deduction. Yes, because it's legitimate. Okay, I, I know for myself, I, I spend about two hours every morning just answering emails. So I, I do that for my home office with my cup of coffee. Um, so what the code says is you have to have um, a, a place inside your home that's used exclusively for your business activity and it has to be a significant business activity but you know if you're a dentist it doesn't mean you're pulling teeth in your home office maybe you're doing all your administrative and all your emailing from your office you have to spend at least 12 hours a week in that office doing that doing that activity um so now once you have this home office now if let's just say your place of business where the other activities start out, like you keep your trucks and stuff like that, are 12 miles away. Now you're, the distance from your home to your other office is deductible. Uh, it also opens up the opportunity to have um, a home athletic facility, which could be a pool or a gym. That's for the benefit of your employees. It's totally legitimate. Um, but without a home office, you can't do that. I like it. So that's something we've got to – really get into with you i think it's uh uh once we start deducting the pool i don't know that makes me a little nervous no it's it's you know it's perfectly legitimate it's in the code it actually in the publication says it okay it's a home athletic facility for the um use of your employees and their families now something that contractors are very fond of is we love our toys we've got our trucks and our cars that Ferrari in the parking lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, how does all that work? Because I know there's car logs, and that's something that um, gets a little scrutiny, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does. And, and the beauty of it, there's so many apps out there right now that you could use um, to, to track your mileage. I mean, like, I park my car now, and I get a little message that, you know, your car is parked, uh, you are, or I get in the car and it says you're a you know, 12 minutes from your office or something like that. Right. So there's so many different apps out there. So car logs should not be a problem. Uh, everything is so electronic these days. Um, but you, know, there has to be a business purpose. Okay. So the Ferrari is probably a real big stretch, but the truck that you use and, uh, the equipment that you buy, those are legitimate deductions. So a truck or a car, we're driving back and forth. We're going out to dinner with it. What can we take as far as a deduction on that, and well, you, what's what's the law on that? Well, the the law is basically you know business use. So maybe your business use is seventy or eighty percent. All right, that's on if you have one vehicle in your family, you know I think seventy or eighty percent might be you know a little tough to uh, document. But if you have two or three v different vehicles, I think um, you could definitely if you are using it seventy or eighty percent of the time, it's it's much simpler to document. And there are other cars available you know for use for personal use so documentation is key and like i said there's just so many apps out there that allow you to you know to track it automatically exactly yeah i use one of those myself so now another thing is travel and entertainment you know contractors like to be big rollers what's uh, <laughs> what's going on there well travel and entertainment um you know Entertainment and meals and entertainment, you know, are deductible 50%. You need to really document, you know, who you're dining out with or entertaining. Um, and then travel, you know, we, we basically have a, a sheet that we use that says, depending on how long you're away, what you're doing, how many different types of business items you have going on during the trip, what portion of it is deductible. But it's funny, the big question we always get is, when I go to a conference, can I deduct that? And the answer is a resounding yes, of course. You're, you're going to a conference to, you know, learn about your business, learn how to market your business or whatever it is, you know, and, and that is fully deductible. So the hotel is deductible, okay? The meals are not deductible, obviously, unless you're taking somebody out. But um, the travel 
um, the lodging, the course is all deductible. And taking your wife along, I think that falls into hiring your family also because that's a non-deductible expense, isn't it, unless she's working with the company? Exactly, exactly. So you, you just want to make sure that you're documenting what you're doing. If she's an employee then, and she's got a role when you're traveling, that's great. Now, another mistake you've got is missing health care strategies. Yes. So missing health care strategies would really be, um, depending on the type of entity you have, you know, is it a medical expense reimbursement plan? Um, depends on how many employees you have, if it makes sense. Uh, then there's home, uh, home health savings accounts that could make sense. Or, or flexible savings accounts. There's a number of different plans you could do, d- depending on the type of entity you have, to make expenses that are deductible, but you typically don't have enough of them to have any type of impact on your taxes. Because the government says to deduct them on Schedule A of your tax return, they have to exceed 10% of your adjusted gross income. So, you know, if you're making 100 grand, that means the first 10,000 is not deductible, and Typically, you know, somebody that has that kind of expense is, you know, is not going to be in that great of shape. Okay. And I've always said there's two reasons to own a small business. And number one is to provide a good lifestyle for you and your family. And the second one is to provide a saleable asset to support you in retirement. And talking about retirement, something I did, which was, and I think is so important to plan for, is to purchase your own building. You can buy the office building. The company pays you rent. You have that separated outside of the company, set up as a separate LLC. That has been a huge benefit for myself. What uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, you know, you're right. Everything you said is 100% correct. Um, you, you purchase a building, you rent it to your business, you set it up in a separate entity. Okay, now you get to depreciate that building. Um, you can also do something that's called um, cross segregation. So you take that building, and let's just say it's a commercial property that's uh, depreciated over 39 years, and we'll say you, you know, it was a hundred thousand dollar building. So basically, you're getting to deduct almost three thousand dollars a year. But if you do cross segregation, it breaks that building up into different um, types of property, some of which are depreciated quicker than 39 years. So typically in the first five years, you wind up with about 20% more depreciation than you would normally. So when you multiply that $100,000 building out by three, four, five, six, it turns into a big tax savings. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, We did that with our building. The write-offs are just so much faster. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's all about helping you keep more of what you make gets back to what we were talking about, which was good tax planning. Well, before we wrap up, Craig, is there anything else you can add to this? You know, I I think what I'd like to add is, you know, communicate with your professionals. That's the, if the, the biggest takeaway from here is communicate with your professionals. And if you're not communicating with your professional, you know, when was the last time he came to, you know, came to you with an idea to save taxes? And if, if you can't answer, you know, that question, I think you need to start looking around for somebody that's going to help you try and keep more of what you make. And not all CPAs are tax planners or tax experts, are they? No, I would say 99% of CPAs are not tax planners. And if you, if you ask most um, what tax planning is, is they would say, well, oh, I meet with my client in December and I tell him how much of a tax deposit he make, needs to make by January 15th. That being said, most CPAs out there are very good at, you know, the compliance work and putting the right numbers in the right boxes. They're just not looking for ways to save you additional taxes. Craig, that's some awesome information that our listeners can take to the bank, certainly. So how can they get more information and get in touch with you? Oh, great. They can. We're actually offering your listeners a copy of our my recent book, which is the 10 most expensive tax mistakes that cost business owners thousands. And they can go to our website, which is uh, www.craigcodyandcompany.com forward slash roofer. And we will give you that link for your show notes. And uh, they just fill out the form online and we will send them a copy of our book. They could also reach us via telephone at 516-869-4051 or via email at craig at ccodycpa.com. And, uh, so, Craig, if we gave you a call, what can you do for us? 
typically our process is I'll have a short call with a person um, and I'll find out a little bit about what's going on. Then we'll ask them to um, send us via a secure email copies of the last two years tax returns and uh, uh, an accounting file. We'll do an analysis and we'll set up a WebEx and on that WebEx we'll go through it and we'll tell them, you know, okay, we've uncovered, you know, $30,000, $40,000 of missed tax deductions that you can be taking that's saving you X amount of dollars. And uh, if you'd like us to do a tax plan, we can do a tax plan for you. We, We get paid up front for a tax plan. Um, it's fully refundable and nobody has ever asked for their money back because it's instant gratification. So we're not talking about an expense here. Where <laughs> it's no, it sounds no. like I, I would say average ROI is the high 300% to 500%. Well, that's great, Craig. I really appreciate you coming on and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, thank you very much for having me and I'd love to be on again. Great. Thanks, Craig. Take care. That's it for today's show. If you want to get a copy of my new guide, Seven Steps to Getting More Qualified Leads for Your Roofing Business, go to my website at theroofershow.com where you can grab it for free or click on the link in the show notes below. And as always, thank you for listening. I really, really appreciate it. We'll see you next time on The Roofer Show.